you? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for making time to talk to me. Hooray! <laughs> Let's hope. If it. I start by saying uh, I'm talking to Frank Listina, who's a fantastic mm -hmm. um, educator, and he's worked with, well, I, I dare say, countless students over, I don't know, decades. Yeah, uh, 30, 35 years. Yeah. I thought you were going to say 35,000 students, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but so and can you, can you give a sort of background about your, your experience with, with teaching? Cause that's, you've done a lot. Yeah, sure. Started in 1980, Danville high school and Southview middle school. So I did two, I did both schools like every day. Um, so that was like a great start because I only not only got to worry about high school, which I, was my ultimate goal, I wanted to teach high school, but I also got to start students in sixth grade and get to experience what that's all about. So that was a really big learning experience for me. Uh, taught there for six years in Danville Public Schools and then Libertyville where you and I met. Yeah. What's Danville like? Can you give people an idea? Sure. Um, Danville is a very different than the Chicago suburbs. Um, Danville is pretty much the central part of the state, right on the Indiana border. Um, fairly big population, I want to say over 40,000. Um, so in some degree, it's a little bit bigger population where I am now in Libertyville. But there's, there are no other big towns around Danville. So, you know, think uh, a big city in the middle of a very rural area. So um, now the other thing that's unique about Danville is uh, it, it has a wide range of social e economic uh, family backgrounds. Um, best way to describe it is uh, one of the major employers at the time was uh, General Motors plant. Mm -hmm. So there were thousands of, of you know families that were there just to work at the General Motors plant. Um, at the same time, uh, all the executives who worked for General Motors also lived in Danville. There was no other town to live in. So I always use it. It was a uh, it was a little micro chasm of of the Chicago suburbs you know you had every range of uh, of uh, families and so forth um, so it was very unique and and the the high school was uh, very diverse uh, we at the time I think one-third of the high school population were african-american students um, some of them were in very low income subsidized housing um, there was another part of town that was mainly trailer uh, trailer park, so it was very uh, very low income, um, and then and then there was the other side of town that the other third was uh, a little more on the upscale, and you know some very nice homes and um, the upper management and so forth. So uh, and all of these students came together at one school. Wow, so wow. it yeah. was a little different. Yeah, it was very different. So then, how does that? Um, can you give us an idea about Libertyville? Because that's the other place you spent a lot of time. Right. Uh, my move to Libertyville. Um, uh, let me let me throw out one other thing about Danville because um, I'm going to contrast that. The uh, the challenges of being the orchestra director in Danville was were that you know a number of the students, one third of the students um, and their families were very interested in classical music and were very uh, interested in the arts. And two-thirds of the families really didn't have a lot of strong background. And there were a lot of opportunities to bring the orchestra and perform for students. And, and it, was, it was, I think, one of the challenges and one of the highlights of trying to get those families involved in orchestra, where typically that might not be their first choice. Mm. Um, so now you... Fast forward to six years later, I'm in Libertyville, and a community that is, I would say, very, uh, very interested in the arts. And uh, um, you know, orchestra. I was able to develop a stronger program after I was there 14 years. Um, eventually, got to the point where there were, I think, 80, 80 string students in two orchestras. So it was, it was really a wonderful place. Wow. But you also ran peripheral groups. So, yes. for example, I know there was Strolling Strings 
uh, which right. was different than the orchestra. Definitely. The strolling strings grew out of my, uh, back to the Danville times. Um, that's where that started. Uh, in, in order to draw uh, students into orchestra when they were, the big competition was marching band and show choir. Um, so in order to get students interested in orchestra, I was looking for something that would, and strolling strings sort of fell into my lap. And uh, I ran with it, and it became very popular in Danville. Everybody in town knew about the strolling strings. It was one of the the, the highlights of the high school. So and what, we what is strolling strings? <laughs> Basically, most strolling groups are, you have strolling violinists. So, you know, strolling... They walk around. Instance. Right, and they walk around and play. Uh, what I had to do was adapt that to my orchestra. So I had cellists and bass players that didn't walk and play. We used a piano to kind of hold everybody together. So there was a core group of piano, cellos, and bass. And the violins and violas would would basically walk around the room and stand around tables or, or chairs if it was just a seating area. Um, and, and would perform for memory out in the audience. Um, probably the most, most often our, our main venue was some kind of a banquet. So you can picture round tables and everybody having dinner, and then the violins would walk around and play, and there would just be this music going on, and every once in a while a musician would walk over your table and serenade you. Mm. And uh, it, it, it really became very popular. We, we could have performed twice a week if we wanted to, and uh, we just had to limit how often the students were out and doing that. Um, that sort of drove the, the program at, at Danville. I mean, it was the strolling strings that kept everybody interested in orchestra and brought new students into orchestra. Um, when, I, when I arrived in Libertyville, um, I did do strolling strings for a number of years. And eventually what happened uh, was that the students, after it was started in the middle school, uh, the students at the high school uh, just kind of thought it was a little childish to do strolling strings. Um, once they did it in middle school, they did it for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and then ninth grade maybe they would do it, but then it was getting a little old by then. Um, so I had to figure out, you know, and, it, and if you don't adapt, you'll, you're in trouble, you know. So uh, I had to figure out where to go from there, and I ended up putting a little emphasis on chamber music and string quartets who also, you know, string quartets could also play at banquets and other functions, but we just took the emphasis off the strolling and, and put it more on, on the music. With the strolling strings, I'm curious, it's, it's, a, it's a very clever way to embed lots of different skills into the musician's sort of vocabulary, because you might not get classical string players who are memorizing music, who are walking around, and... Right. Uh, and I don't think people ever noticed or complained or worried about that, did they? The students? No, students never did. Um, I, probably you and I never talked about it. Um, you know, there was there were questions from colleagues. You know, there were colleagues at both Danville and Libertyville who kind of wondered whether I should be spending so much time on on pop music and you know, and am I ignoring the classics? And um, and I really didn't have a problem with that. Uh, what, what I found is, uh, and, and our colleagues in the choral world uh, totally understand this, if you really want to develop your choir, you work on unison. You don't work on part singing all the time. You know, to develop the voice, to sing in octaves or in unison uh, is an, a very important skill. And it really allows you to focus on tone quality, to focus on phrasing, to focus on intonation. And I found that exact same thing with, with strolling strings. The violins and violas played melody more often than harmony um, since they were walking around the room. It makes sense. You don't want to hear harmony in, by your table. So we did a lot of unison playing with the uh, violins and all, viol uh, all violins and violas. Um, I thought that was wonderful for, uh, for intonation. Uh, it was real easy to teach about phrasing with some of the popular music we were using. Um, and uh, uh, as students, I think, played with better tone, played with better intonation, and understood melodies. Um, 
and especially for the students who often would get stuck in the second violin section or in the viola section and didn't have that opportunity to play melodies, I think it was very helpful. So I, I, I really didn't worry too much about colleagues who criticized that. Students never complained and audiences never complained. They loved hearing that music. Absolutely. I think it's a fantastic way in and there, I think the benefits are far more than, than students certainly at the time realized. Oh, I think so, yeah. And I'm sure that those benefits also spilled over into the orchestra. Uh, I, I saw it all the time. I mean, I, I felt like, uh, it, as you mentioned, some of the music, you know, we would do some, uh, some fiddle music, we do some bluegrass, we do, and what, what happens is students really don't mind practicing, and they're practicing things that are really developing technique, and you see their fingers moving faster, and, you know, so it, it really worked, and then I think our, our playing, uh, uh, that all transferred to the classical side. Yep. So in the orchestra, with the orchestra, one of the things that uh, that you did so well is that y you had this school group, and you've got all these these students who are they're bound by the academic year, and you you get a new intake, but you sort of form them into a new group, and then how do you how do you that's going to be my first question how do you deal with that a changing group and the new students how do you bed them in? You mean like every year we have a yep. oh, some leave and some come in? And yep. Every year is a different challenge, and uh, you have. Uh, I've, uh, it has, it continues for whatever reason, uh, over the 30, I taught it for 33 years. So it's been 35 years now that I've been in education and there's this trend that happens where you have a strong class every three to five years. And when you have that very strong class, more students seem to be better, higher skill levels when they're seniors and they leave and then you have another group that comes in. Uh, you have to adjust. You have to kind of uh, think, all right, what literature am I going to be playing? And, uh, uh, and you have that every year to some degree. But some years, um, it, there isn't really much that you notice. You know, the, the students all get better and you, and you just start over at the beginning of the year. Um, it's usually a little bit, the beginning of the year takes a little time to get students who didn't practice much over the summer get their fingers back working again but it's it happens very quickly you know uh, two or three weeks into the school year it seems like we're back where we started at so how do you motivate them what do you do <sighs> oh i'll tell you i've thought about this a lot uh, so when someone asks you so how do you how do you make this work um, the one number one thing that comes to mind every time is literature or repertoire um, i I find that uh, you need to find challenging repertoire that doesn't frustrate students. Um, now, uh, if you're not challenging them, uh, they, they tend to get bored. And if you challenge them, not only challenging the entire orchestra, but you have to keep in mind individual sections. So, uh, you know, if you have a really strong viola section, um, it, it would be bad planning to work on literature that doesn't challenge the viola section. Um, as you know, there are many pieces out there that, uh, you know, whereas the first violin part is incredibly challenging with very high position work and fast, and then sometimes the second violin and the viola part might not have much in there at all. Um, so you have to select that piece uh, on purpose at the right year. Um, and the same thing with every section. And when you add wind players to that section, um, it doesn't make any sense to play Mozart if you have a very talented brass section and low brass, because they are not going to have a lot of, a lot of interesting things to play. So you have to be very careful about what you select. Mm. How do you use the the school year and the concerts, and how do you manage the the difficulty of having holidays? Yes, well, it gets to the point where you know the school schedule, you know when things are going to start. Uh, typically, we will do four concerts a year, and. Um, so I know my first concert's going to happen in early November, and I'll have two months to prepare for that. So I have lots of time to prepare. 
Um, and uh, sometimes I'll actually be thinking about literature for future concerts. You know, uh, for me, that first concert also was, if you remember, shared with the middle school. So we had a lot of time to prepare for that middle school, high school joint festival. Um, and we couldn't play too much music on that concert because it would be too long of a concert. So what happens is I end up sometimes thinking about a major work that I will perform in March, and we may start one movement or work on something technique-wise that we need to have for that work that we want to do in, in March. So there's a little bit of planning for the whole year, um, and at the same time, keeping in mind, we have to have a concert in November, We'll do a holiday concert in December, and then we have our major, our probably our biggest orchestra alone concert in March. So that's when you want to do a major, uh, maybe a full symphony, um, maybe a, a very challenging work for students. I think something that's interesting about that is from the student's point of view, um, thinking back as being a student in the orchestra and things, you have no idea that the teacher has any idea, you know, that, that you've thought all these things through and you might be working on technique and planning ahead several months and and the way you might introduce pieces so that it's not um, overwhelming when you get to that big work. Well, exactly. And, um, and I have to say, and one reason you probably didn't notice it too much is I learned that over the years. So I was doing much more of that in the last 15 years than I did uh, before that. Um, my, my Vernon Hills time, I, that was my third school we didn't get to yet, uh, is where I really started to have to plan more for the concerts and because uh, I wanted to keep doing quality literature. Now how, what about the other commitments of the students musically? Because sometimes they would do um, contests or uh, little competitions, or or there would you would hold competitions for uh, there might be soloists that play with the orchestra. Right. Um, yes. The one of the philosophies that I came up with years ago, um, as I as I listened to my students, uh, some students of course would want to stay in orchestra for all four years of high school. Uh, they were never going to give it up. That was really important to them. Um, and yet other students that had many other interests. So years ago, I just, I don't know how I came up with this, just thinking about it. Um, I thought there really had to be more of a two or three tier system. So what I, what I really wanted to do was, okay, if you want to be an orchestra, you have to perform on the four concerts, you have to prepare the music, and you have to practice a little bit. But then there were other students who were much more interested in music. Uh, let's take the highest level first. Um, we always had a senior concerto audition. What I wanted to do was um, challenge students and by making that a senior option, um, students at freshman and sophomore level could look to that and plan ahead and they could start thinking, maybe I'd like to do that. So there was an incentive for them to stay in the orchestra program and maybe want to be a senior soloist and for them to study privately and for them to practice more than others. Um, so senior solos was one of the things that I felt was very important to the success of the programs. Another one was chamber music. As you come in as a freshman, you'll always find one or two very fine players on each instrument. And um, I like to pull out a string quartet and have them work on a Beethoven string quartet, let's say. Uh, one of my favorites, if we had a talented group, was the Be Beethoven Opus 18, uh, number one in F major. Um, it, it was just an amazing work. And as soon as students played it, they were totally you know, totally in love with chamber music. Um, so I had a list of chamber pieces that I would offer to students. And, uh, of course, we could then perform that at contest. Uh, we could perform that if we had something that honor society, let's say, you know, and the string quartets could perform. Uh, but I felt chamber music was a big outlet for the more serious, technically advanced students. Um, 
Then there was solo and ensemble contest, as I mentioned, so you could do a solo or an ensemble. Um, and one other one that we did, we participated in, was called IMEA, so Illinois Music Educators Association, uh, ran an all-state orchestra in the middle of the year, and it was by audition. So you could work with students and prepare them on advanced literature, and they would audition to try and have an opportunity to be selected as an all-state musician. Uh, so there were three or four tiers of you know, interest for students to get involved beyond strolling strings. Yeah. From the teacher's point of view, what part of what made your teaching so successful is you had planned for all those, you were catering for all those different levels, and, and it, uh, it certainly wasn't an afterthought, any of those events. And also on top of that, you took people on trips. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot about trips. <laughs> How could you forget Another trips? <laughs> I don't know if anything is more motivating, you know, than uh, saying, how would you like to, uh, you know, hop on a plane, fly to France and play a concert, you know. And uh, so we did that. I, I probably did 12 uh, major trips over my 35 years of teaching uh, with students. And um, uh, almost everyone was, uh, you know, performing trips and uh, highlights for so many students. Um, and that, of course, would attract students of all levels. So you had, you know, you had the advanced students, you had students who were maybe um, marginal in their technical ability, but they would work harder in order to be able to do that, to be in the symphony orchestra and to travel. Um, so trips were a huge motivating. And you, you mentioned that over the years you've learned all these things. How have you learned it? How, what have been the most influential things, obviously experience, but have there been any, any sort of key moments when you thought, aha, is it watching people or talking to people? or? Yeah, um, really it, it, it's a combination of everything. Um, really, uh, when I was in high school, my high school orchestra did a trip overseas. So I was immediately hooked and I thought, what an amazing possibility. Um, then when I got to Danville, I wasn't sure that we could actually travel, find enough students who would be able to afford a major trip because the school didn't pay for it. Students had to either raise funds or parents had to pay for the student's trip. Um, and what happened in Danville was a school offered to share a trip with us. So I only had to have half the students in the group and I could go with another school. So, you know, it's just a matter of I would love to travel. I knew that would make a difference to students. I had to find a way. And then all of a sudden somebody offered, would you like to come with us? Um, now, when I got to uh, Libertyville, the very first trip was band and orchestra and choir all together. And then everybody was like, yeah, this is good. I like traveling. So then I could do a trip with just the orchestra. So you have to kind of just figure out ways to make it happen. Every day I'm learning something new. Um, it's a different perspective for me now. Um, what now, the only time I work with students is when I'm going in and working with other orchestras. Um, so it's a different perspective when when they're not your own students. Um, you know, when you see students every day, you know them. Um, so, yeah, I have a different perspective there. Uh, I'm also, I have more time to share my, my knowledge and my experience with colleagues. So, much like now, well, I haven't thought about strolling strings in a long time, you know, but uh, when we're done here, uh, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll make some notes about, oh, it's a good thing. I have to remember when somebody asks me about, um, so, uh, you know, having that perspective, now I share that with other colleagues. Often then they will share ideas with me of something that's worked for them. Um, so I don't have an orchestra to try that on, but I'll just keep that in my, you know, my list of here's, here are things to build a program. Um, and one other thing that's happening with me now is uh, last year I worked at a small college in, um, uh, in Wisconsin called Carthage College. 
And I taught, uh, I was like the assistant orchestra director there, so I worked with a very small string section. Um, and then I did the methods class for the, the wind players who were in education. I taught them their string methods. So working with college students as beginners was a whole new experience for me. Um, and I learned a lot doing that. Um, and this year, I'm working with uh, private lesson students at DePaul University and teaching them their educational pedagogy, if you will. So how to be a private lesson teacher and how to, be, uh, how to do sectionals, how to coach cello bass sections. Um, so I'm learning something because I'm in new, new situations. I would like to do even more. Um, one of my favorite things to do is guest conducting, and um, and you know, as you and I talked, we you know I did the All State Orchestra in Illinois last year, which was a huge honor for me to do that. Um, but I continue working with middle school students, middle school summer camps, and high school level. So I really enjoy the challenge of meeting a large group of students in a festival situation and they're meeting for the first time and somehow we have to make it work often in one day mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole different skill set um, and probably a new new role of mine was one of my uh, younger colleagues uh, contacted me about a week ago and said so I'm guest conducting the junior orchestra for IMEA help <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and so I had to think about it, and I I wrote just a you know a, a, an email with like four or five little things that I think would help her that mm. I wish I'd known for my first festival, and uh, one was about pacing in the very first half hour. She she wrote back after it was over said it was so successful and you were right on that first half hour. My mind was racing to like figure out what I need to do first. Where do I go from there? Because you, you don't, there's no planning like you do with your own orchestra. You know, in your own orchestra, you know the students, you know what they're going to come with, and then you just plan. But here you walk in, and your first 10 minutes is planning what your next half hour is going to be. And then you have to, at break time, plan the next half of the day. Um, I love that challenge. Um, and if the group sounds good at the end of the day, I feel it's successful. You know, two thoughts. One is I saw this on your, either on your website or on the note that you wrote me about fun versus challenge. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I'll tell you, I think, I think one of the reasons that I've been successful at the high school level is never losing track of the fact that you have students at all levels. And you're going to have students who are only excited about orchestra because they want to be in pit orchestra and they want to play for the musical. And then they're in and the next thing you know, they come to you and they say, wow, that Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony was my favorite piece of music ever. So what, what you draw them in any way you can and, you know, and keep all that stuff fun and interesting. And then you never know when all of a sudden they're going to love Shostakovich as their favorite composer. Um, so that's one thought I had. Um, and I think that's what, that's what worked for me, just keeping a pulse on how the students felt, what they were excited about, and always having something that's fun to do. You know what I... You know what I, <laughs> let me see if I can think of the name here. Um, a flash mob, I finally oh, thought yeah. of it, you know, which are popular on the internet right now. Believe it or not, I'm a huge fan of flash mob orchestra, of just finding a way to like, hey, let's just surprise everybody and go and sit, sit in the lobby and play. And we've done it a couple of times with success because I think it, it's, it's a way of bringing music to an audience that normally wouldn't come to a concert if you advertised because they don't know what's going to happen. So I love that element of, of surprise. Okay, I'm done with that topic. 
Can I throw out one more? Yeah. Um, and I saw this on your uh, on, on one of your um, on your website. Uh, it's my new motto, if you will. It's not what you teach, but how you teach. And the how is something that I think has to have the most focus right now. It really isn't a matter of teaching rhythm and what rhythms you're going to teach. It's just how you teach rhythms. How do you, how do you walk into a classroom and approach something as complex as rhythm? Or for orchestra, for strings, how do you teach intonation? You know, there are lots of, I mean, everybody knows you do scales, you do long tones, you do, you know, they have all the what to do. But just because you're playing scales doesn't necessarily mean your students are playing in tune. Mm -hmm. It's how you teach those scales and how you approach them that's really important. And I spend a lot of time thinking how I'm going to get my younger orchestra to reach a new level of intonation. Um, and I, I think that's something I wish I could. I need to develop that and sort of say, it's not just what you teach, but this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. So that's my focus right now. It's that's trying to get those, those hows and, um, and, and also helping other colleagues who are now at that level where they're starting to be guest conductors. Yeah, brilliant. I think some of those hows come out of the, the previous point where you said you kept a pulse on what was interesting to the students because a lot of the how depends on an open communication. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do, did I ever do an um, anonymous survey when you were in, in no. school? I've done those over the years. And, uh, you know, it's like the suggestion box, mm. you know, but it was required. I would, I would pass out a sheet of paper and I would ask students to, uh, um, and, you know, I, I would have some basic, you know, just to ask them for ideas doesn't always work. No. But I would sit down and I'd say, okay, please list, you know, your, the favorite piece of music that we've done so far. Tell me what, you know, what, what is your least favorite thing that we do in a class, you know? And then I'll hear back from students and say, oh, I just hate it when you just spend 20 minutes just working with the bass section because they're out of tune. And we're just sitting there. So I've just I've kept a pulse of what's going on by just handing it out, giving them some general questions. And the last question would always be, tell me anything else you think I need to know. And I don't want any names on the paper. I mean, I really want it to be anonymous. I just want to read these. And, you know, I mean, there are a few every once in a while. Somebody will say something that hurts your feelings or whatever, you know. But generally speaking, students in orchestra they're there to make, they want orchestra to improve too. So they're going to give you great ideas. They're going to give you all sorts of things. And then you just have to be able to adapt and say, okay, I have to do more Beethoven and do less Mahler <laughs> or whatever <laughs> the students yeah. say. <laughs> there are lots of, lots of things to think about there. So I'll, I'll officially say thank you very much to Frank Lestina for taking time to talk to me. And I, I hope, with permission, I'll link to one or two of your... You've got some really good recordings of orchestras floating around in the ether. I will do that. Um, yeah, there are a few that I really like that I'll, that I'll send. And, um, yeah, maybe with even a description a little bit. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, awesome.